You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast from Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis, hosting as usual, and we're joined today by returning Reds legend Gary Bertels. Good afternoon, Gary. How are you? Good afternoon. Yeah, good, thank you. Good. And we're joined by Steve. Are you a Reds legend? Are you a Reds great? Are you a former Reds player? How do you view yourself? Sorry, I missed that. You broke up on me completely that much. Sorry. <laughs> are you a are you a Reds legend or a for, uh, No, friend? I'm I'm, uh, I'm a supporter of Gary Burtles. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, regardless, you're joined by Steve. We're joined by Steve Chettle, who I would class as a Reds legend for um, his long and diligent and impressive service. So, Steve, are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, not bad at all. Good, 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 good. So we're going to talk um, mostly about the sixth game unbeaten, um, the cup win against Cardiff, 1-0. Um, I was there and I saw it. It wasn't the greatest game, but uh, a good win and they built it on good foundations. Um, I mean, Gary, you, you you often say a win's a win. What will they take from victory in the cup? Look, winning's a good habit, no matter what competitions it in. You know, Brian Clough always preached that. And we went out in every competition to win the game by as many as we possibly could. And the more games you win, the more confidence you get. I know the FA Cup's been a little bit belittled at times. People make a lot of changes. But uh, Cardiff have always beaten us at the city ground. So we've turned that round and we've won 1-0. Uh, three minutes into the game, we get the goal and we don't concede. So that's got to be a big positive. And he's seen a lot of what he wants to uh, in his squad. He's he made eight changes. And I'm sure he's, in his own mind, getting to grips with his best 11, which he, he needs to do. And he's got the foundations right at the moment by the look of it with the back four. It's looking very solid. It's just in that final third. I think he has admitted that himself. In, we need to start creating a little bit more um, for the strikers. And if you can build on what we've done so far, then, you know, the, the January transfer window could be very interesting if we can get rid of a few and bring uh, a few players in. From a managerial point of view, Steve, do you think Chris has, has gone in there with the intention of laying defensive foundations with you look at the defensive record? Is he trying to give Forrest a platform to build on to become more attacking? Well, yeah, you have to. You have to at least start the game. You start the game with a point. If you keep a clean sheet, you've, at least you're going to get is that point. You know, I think they've just kept the fourth clean sheet out of six games. Uh, just having some consistency through, especially the back two, uh, is, is a great start. But like like Baz says, you know, you, you need to go out there and be in the game to start with and for three minutes scoring the goal and hanging on for 87. And at times they were hanging on. Uh, but it's another clean sheet. And, you know, they go through to the next round of the cup for the first time in three seasons, I think it is. Mm. I mean, how, how much does the cup mean in, in these days? Do you think the romance of it's been taken away, Steve, just because not having fans there? Is it uh, not possibly, a point? Possibly, possibly the big teams aren't uh, so, so invested in it, shall we say. But it's, you know, it's a prestigious competition. And especially the ones who are out the top, maybe the top six of the uh, Premier League, can go on to win a trophy and it's silverware for somebody. And looking specifically at Forrest, Gary, I guess he's made eight changes. And he will he have learned from those players who've come in? I mean, Gaten Bong had a good game, Carl Jenkins and Jordan Smith. That must be encouraging for the manager to know that he can call on those players in his hour of need now, can't he? Yeah, it gives him a headache as well. Those players have come in, done a good job for him. And they'll say, right, OK, leave me out if you dare. And, uh, you know, that's what he wants to see. He wants competition for places. I mean, I looked at two games yesterday from the FA Cup, the Leeds-Crawley game, where Crawley absolutely hammered Leeds. And I looked at the Tottenham Marine game, which could have been a banana skin. The pitch looked terrible. But what a professional performance from Tottenham. You know, no, no surprise with Jose Mourinho. Didn't take any chances. You know, they looked from the, the first whistle that like they were going to take it very seriously. And obviously Leeds maybe didn't. I didn't see the game, but I saw quite a bit of the uh, Marine Tottenham game. And you've got to be impressed. And it's like uh, Deli Ali. You know, he, he he made a case again for himself being in the team because you know until he went off, he played well. He was creative. You know, he looked like the old uh, Deli Ali. And you know that that's the competition. Sort of competition it is. It gives players like him an opportunity to come in and say, right, leave me out if you dare. And getting that early goal, Steve, that must make such a difference. Forrest have fallen short so often of conceding a sloppy early goal and going behind themselves. To actually be the ones to go in front, that must be a big big boost for the manager. 
Well, it is, like I said before, you, you know, if you have to keep clean sheets to get points in games, it's a really tough task for the back four and the goalkeeper. But I think Forest have only scored t- uh, two goals in three games this season. So to go ahead, you know, it gives you a, you know, a massive, it gives you something to hang on to. And they did that really well. How's he going to make them more attacking? I mean, because you, you, it's a balancing act, isn't it? He could go a bit too far the other way. So how does he make them more of a threat, do you think? I don't know. Defi- trying to find a, probably a creative midfield player at the top third of the pitch, really. He's got, you know, out-and-out goal scores in Lyle Taylor and Lewis Graben. But, you know, maybe something behind there. Joe Lolly's not scoring goals this season like he did last season. Uh, just find something a little bit more creative, maybe. and But building on that sound defence like you've just spoken about. Mm. Is that the big miss for you, Gary? That that number ten figure or a box to box midfielder still? Well, I've said that before, haven't I? I think every time I come on, I say final third so important. Uh, it, it, so many times I've seen Forest sort of score a goal and maybe hang on and, and try and hang on and then concede late goals. And you've seen Cavallio disappear. Uh, you've seen all sorts of you know the creation uh, in midfield disappear out the team. You feel, for me, if they've got that in in their locker, in that final third, with the strikers they've got, the ch- the chances can be created. And, you know, we can make an effort to move up that table. Uh, at the moment, that's the one thing that's lacking for me. The back four looks solid, whoever plays it. I think the two at the moment, uh, McKenna and Worrell, look absolutely, you know, terrific, the pair of them. They've got a really good understanding. Uh, they're both vocal. You know, they both like directing things on the pitch, which I like to see. I like vocality uh, on the pitch. I don't think you often see that uh, a lot in the, in the modern game now. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of plus- pluses there, and you've got to give you know Chris time. I was listening to uh, Harry Redknapp um, about 10, 15 minutes ago. You know, talking about Mark, uh, Arteta at Arsenal, saying four or five games ago they were talking about getting rid of him and do relegation. Then all of a sudden they win four or five games, and you know he's he's a great manager again. The same with Ollie Solskjaer, you know, all the stick he was getting and all of a sudden they're right up there and, you know, opinions change. So it's it, it's one of those games, football, where managers now don't get the chance and don't get the time they need. But I think uh, the, t- the time is right to give Chris a chance. Mm. I mean, you'll preach to that, won't you, Steve, as a manager? You need you need time, don't you, to actually make you, you know, be effective, don't you? Well, you do. He's obviously coming in. He inherited a squad. Uh, you know, it's going to be a huge January for him to hopefully get something that he wants and b- building on the things that we've already spoken about. So it's a huge January, but it's difficult for him to take a group of players and from a, a losing mindset, really, in one way, to make them positive and grind out results to get points to go up the table because, you know, he still doesn't look great down the bottom of the table and you've got to attract a player that's going to get you into the mid-third and then hopefully towards the top. Just going back to what Gary was saying then, um, Worrell and um, McKenna, is that the partnership for you, Gary, now for the rest of the, the season if their form and form fitness are there? Yeah, if they stay fit, without a doubt. If they can hang on to Worrell, there's a lot of talk still about he, he might go in uh, the January window. You hope that's not the case. Um, but it happens. You know, we've lost key players before. I think the big thing for Chris is the, the players he wants to get rid of. You know, that squad is bigger than probably anybody in the championship. And, uh, you know, you can't keep everybody happy. So I, I'd like to see quite a few out the door so you can be given... The options of bringing who he wants to bring in and, and the quality he wants to bring in. Mm. Um, we've got two good guests today to talk about defending. Steve, um, apart from a rare foray on the right wing at Chelsea, I think you you pretty much were a central defender your whole career. Um, what makes a good defensive pairing then? Is, uh, does there have to be a balance? Do players want to be a leader, want someone who can bring the ball out? I mean, does that matter? How do you view defensive pairings? Well, individually, I think you've got to want to defend. You know, people speak about, you know, aspects of what makes a really good centre-back and they speak about distribution and stepping out into into midfield. You've got to be able to defend 1v1s. You've got to head balls. You have to block. And like I say, when I was told when I was playing, you know, then you give the ball to the better players in the team, which is the rest of the 10 that's in the team. But, you know, then you can look at pairings. You look at maybe a left-side centre-back and a right-side centre-back. Do they get on? Do they have much in common? Do they know much about each other? And it's something that you have to really work on. You know, I've played with Des for a long time and also played with Colin Coop for a while. Uh, but you have to get to know people's strengths, you have to know people's weaknesses. But it looks like in the two of those, you've got two people who really want to defend. Uh, they're happy defending. 
and they want to lead and make sure they keep clean sheets because it makes you look good and you feel good after the game. Hmm. Did you ever adapt your game? Say you were with Colin Cooper there. Did, did you do something different to how you played with Des Walker or, or were you the same defender? All the way yeah, through it your... was, <laughs> the game kind of changed. It was kind of uh, two periods where we played. When myself played with Des, I tend to play in front of Des and Des played behind me. So any well, common mistakes that I made, Des was always the one mopping up behind. When myself and Colin played, it was more of a left and right partnership. Uh, so the game did change in that, you know, in that seven or eight years from playing with Des and playing alongside Colin. But you have to adapt from how the team wants to play and what suits both of you the best. Mm. This might sound a stupid question. Is one of you in charge of the offside line and stuff like that? Is there one player who has to be that big voice or not? No, it depends where the ball is on the pitch. Uh, it depends mm. where the ball is, you know, unless somebody makes a stupid run. I'd, I'd advocate defending the ball in the first place, I mean, as opposed to just throwing your arm up and leaving somebody run offside. Gary, you like talking about being a defender. What makes a good defensive pairing for you when you played at the back point in your career? Communication, uh, to start with. And I, I always, when I was a striker, um, before I got in the team, I always used to look what I could bring if I got in the team to Tony Woodcock or Paul, uh, Peter With, um, and, you know, try to get that in my mind. And if I did get the opportunity, and, and the same goes for playing centre-half. What can I bring to my partner's game? And I think communication is the biggest thing. You know, you need loud voices out there and, you know, to keep the line high. Uh, that was one of the main things for me. I didn't like uh, when I played dropping too deep because that encouraged people on and put you under more pressure. And I, I played late in my career at centre-half at Grimsby with Paul Futcher, who was absolutely wonderful. You know, he he got no pace whatsoever, reasonable in the air. But my word, did he read the game? And was it, you know, was it, his instructions were absolutely fantastic. He read the game well. You don't always have to have pace. You know, I was lucky because I played up front as well. And I, when I went back there, I sort of knew by instinct what strikers were going to do. So that helped me going into that position. And I was, I was always good in the air. So that helped as well. And I could pass it, which also helped as well. Uh, so in that respect, I was lucky going back there. But I said to you before, I also tried to play left back. Cluffy played me there against Southampton when Stuart Pearce got injured. And I had the most torrid game I've ever had in my life. I thought it'd be a piece of cake. But I was playing against Danny Wallace, who was one of the quickest, nippiest wingers uh, there was. And he turned me inside out, you know, made a fool of me. So, you know, defence is not always easy. You know, don't, don't take it for granted that it is. Um, but I think communication above anything else, you know, if you can tell your mate what's, what's around him, what's going on, and keep doing that for 90 minutes. And concentration, I always say, that's one of the biggest qualities you've got to have in football at any level. Because you haven't got that concentration and you switch off. And I think that's what your mate does. He doesn't allow you to switch off. I never allowed who I played with, you know, to switch off. You know, I kept going at them, you know, always cajoling, always talking. And uh, I think that's, you know, the making of a good partnership when you can do that together, both of you, and accept it. You know, even mm. if it's criticism sometimes which, you know, it was when I played, you know, I think that's the, the basis of a good partnership. Off on a tangent here a bit, Steve, was there a, who, who was the player you most hated playing against as, a, as an opponent? Was there a particular type of player or an individual that you think always gave you a really tough time when you were at Forest? Uh, no, it, like I say, it was, as a game, it was another kind of era change. You went from playing against people who were kind of your shape and uh, your height uh, from like you know, Quince to playing against people like Robbie Fowler and Michael Owen, so it, it changed. The tough ones are, are the best ones, uh, which have an all round game. They want to run behind, they're good in the air, uh, they'll pin you, they'll smack you around, uh, but you just got to cope with it. And you got to try and, like you say, Buzz said, you try and plan ahead and try and play smarter than the centre forward as well that you're playing against. Hmm. Is that Harry Kane now carrying off on this tangent? Is he the best uh, all round? He's, he's probably the best all round striker that there is, yes. I think so. Uh, mm. Obviously, Liverpool have got whippets in your, you know, your top three there. Uh, Manchester City don't have a recognised striker, but they still somehow score goals and get fantastic results and play some great football. So it's a different breed of striker now than what there was, you know, back when I first started playing. Mm -hmm. Um. You, again, you're probably biased, Steve. Is the centre-back pairing the most important pairing on the pitch? And is it, is it again, the foundation uh, yeah, you build? It's a, it's a solid line? foundation. Your goalkeeper, your two centre-backs, right mm -hmm. through the spine of your team. It's always has been and probably always will be. Uh, you've got normally a, a holding midfield player or you know an old-fashioned ratter or a dog, and then you've got somebody who can score goals at the top of the pitch. 
So if you can have a strong, steady spine, which consistently keep playing and, and get better and better and better, like Joe and uh, McKenna are at the moment, you know, they have a chance. Mm. You mm. talk about that spine. I think the problem at the moment, we've seen so many midfield players in our careers, Chet. Um, I played with Steve Hodge, with Neil Webb, with Ian Bowyer. You know, midfield players who went past me as a striker, who weren't held back and who were given the license to do that, and who caused so many problems doing that. You know, you, you don't see many of them now, and they used to cause so many problems because who was going to pick them up? You know, that was the the, the problem for defenders when they saw that happening. Do I pick him up, or you know, is the midfield player who should be picking him up as he lost him? And I, I think that is a, a, a dying art a little bit in the game. It's great to see, you know, Lampard did it, Gerard did it, players like that. And they were fantastic at it, you know, about the timing. And I think Foden's another one, that Man City, who, who does it particularly well. And, um, you know, it, it is an art. And you see Son at uh, Tottenham. You know, these sort of players, it, it happens now a little bit more um, at the, the top level than it does, I think, lower down. Is that a big miss for Forrest this season? I mean, Ryan Yates is the only one I can think of who's run beyond the striker or really breaks into the box. Is that one of the reasons Forrest has been scoring enough goals, do you think? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. You know, even, uh, you know, when I was, like I say, I'll go back to when I was playing, when Nigel played as the nine, he was one of these kind of false nines or such. You had know, Roy Keane who used to run past him. Uh, so that was, you know, in, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but he's getting somebody to run from midfield. You know, people now pigeonholed a little bit. Oh, I'm a holding midfield player. I'm a 10 or whatever I am. If you're a midfield player, you have to have a little bit of everything in there and be prepared at times to run past strikers and get yourself on a third man run score goal in the box. Hmm. What about if Forrest don't sign a number 10? And um, would you like to see grabbing off Taylor, Steve? Is that something that is worth looking at rather than a, rather than a two up top, a slightly different take on it? Well, you've got to work out what formation suits best the team, what best suits the personnel. And if you can play two at the top of the pitch, I think it always pins their back four back a little bit more. Uh, but obviously it takes a body out of midfield. So you have to weigh up the pros and cons of all the formations that you're playing and where you want to be strongest, but giving yourself a chance to score most goals. Mm -hmm. Are you to come in, Gary? You want to advocate that? When, uh, you know, our team, you know, we, when we played two up front, you don't often see two up front anymore. Um, and they had Robbo and Martin O'Neill on, on the wide areas and, you know, two central midfield players. John McGovern used to be, you know, more or less the holding player. And, you know, it, it, it worked in those days. Whether it would so much now, I'm not sure. I'd like to think it would because I, I think you can work around systems. You can outfox systems. And I, I just think, like Steve said, he hit the nail on the head. It engages defenders. I think the one problem we've seen with Forrest over the past couple of years is because we play one up front and it's been defensively minded a little bit, then you, you find it difficult to get support to that lone striker. And it, it becomes easy for defenders against playing against you to bring the ball out from the back and, and then put more pressure on, you know, Forrest as a midfield and as a back four. And then you get pushed further and further back. When you do get the opportunity to break, it's a hell of a run to try and get up and support Lewis Graben or, you know, Lyle Taylor. And it, it's it, it's difficult. You've got to try and get that uh, happy medium. Mm, mm, true, true. Um, let's, uh, before we look ahead to the Millwall game then, let's look backwards, talking of the good old days. Steve, you were the, the first guest on this podcast, the proper one, which we were grateful for. And I remember you saying at the time that you cleaned Gary's boots. Um, very was he, well. Very well, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, was he... Yeah, a good, yeah. He's a proper chap. <laughs> was Gary a good person to clean the boots for? Did he give you a load of abuse? And, you know, no, he, he, gave, he gave me boots, to be fair. Uh, anything that uh, Gary had finished with, uh, I had boots. Obviously, I was an apprentice and earning very little money. He used to get one pair of boots a year. Uh, but Buzz very kindly tipped me at Christmas, uh, gave me boots whenever they were needed. So it, it was a role that I really enjoyed. I, you know, I put my heart and soul into being an apprentice and... I enjoyed every minute of it and it's a dying art now. I don't think many apprentices will clean boots anymore, but it's something that you have to try and take pride in. Uh, and, it, and it just gives you a good standing for, you know, for the rest of your career and your life, really. You, it was a really good upbringing, to be fair, as being an apprentice at Forest. Two fantastic years. Uh, Greg Orham asked, how much did he give you at Christmas? <laughs> I bet you don't oh, remember. The, the equivalent nowadays of, oh, crikey, I think it was three and six he gave me back in the day. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> 
I used to give you more than that. You, you know did that. give me more than that. I don't, want, I don't want to give away how flamboyant you were with your money, Gaz. <laughs> what was Steve yeah. like as an apprentice, Gaz? If was I probably good? hadn't been, I'd been better off now. <laughs> <laughs> was Steve a good apprentice? Oh, he's excellent. You know, very professional. I mean, they all were. There were, you know, two or three that, you know, tried tried it on a little bit or a little bit cocky. But he was never like that. You know, I think he uh, they understood, especially with the gaffer, you know, he just didn't uh, try and get away with very much uh, when he was in charge. They used you know. to scare the life out of you, Matt. Yeah, he did. In the dress rooms in the morning, it was a really scary place to be. Uh, and the, the worst culprit was Bomber. Bomber was an absolute nightmare in the morning. He'd come in normally in a grumpy mood. And I was a tea boy as well. So I made tea for the first team every morning for two years. Uh, so if you cop Bomber on a bad morning, you just got it. It's not just a bad morning. It's a bad afternoon and bad evening with him. He's, he's just the same. He's, he's still the same now. He's still cantankerous. He was my rude partner as well. So I had to put up with that as well. <laughs> did you, Gary? Oh, you probably can't remember that as well. Did you think Steve was going to make it? I don't know if you saw him play or not. Did you think he was yeah, going to? Yeah, of course I did. You know, we went to watch the uh, the young lads play. You know, the gaffer liked to see us go, go and see those sort of games at times. No, you could always see. You could always see as a player, the ones who are going to make it and have got a chance. I mean, I, when I was at Man United for two years, I was there. Mark Hughes was just coming through. Norman Whiteside were just coming through. And it was blatantly obvious that, you know, those two were going to come through and make it. And not, you know, blowing smoke to chat. You could see, you know, he got a big chance if he did it the right way and, uh, you know, if he was professional about it. And he was, you know, he did everything he was told, more or less. And, uh, you know, it was no surprise to see him go on and do what he did. Mm -hmm. How do you bring through young players now, Steve? You work with young players at base, but obviously it's different levels and it's not the Premier League, and I appreciate that. But how do you uh, educate young players, footballers and men? Give them good core values. Uh, be You know, be human beings. Uh, show a bit of humility. Uh, and just be good, sound people, you know. And the, the players that want to learn will learn. Uh, they'll ask to do more. Uh, we give them all individual programs, but the ones who are really, really successful, the ones that try and take on most information well. Uh, we've got some two or three really good players here at Baseford. But like I say, in the times that I've worked in youth development, I work with Joe, I work with Patrick, I work with uh, Jamal, Ben Osborne, Oliver Burke. So, you know, like I say, the academy produces fantastic footballers at Nightingale Forest. Uh, and hopefully still with, like I say, the likes of Alex Mighton and Joe, you know, they're still producing fantastic players. Mm. Is that the core value at Forest? I mean, you were there not that long ago, and Gary Brazil still around now. It is the core thing that they develop them to be good people who can go on and hopefully have a career in the game, even if it's absolutely. not absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You just create good people to you know to strive in life, really, uh, and those core values will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Paul Hart should take a, a lot of credit for you know what's going on now. You know, he set the standard at Forest all those years ago with the players he got coming through the academy. And, uh, you know, you can build on that. And I think Forrest have built on it. Gary Brazil's, you know, done a really good job as well. And, uh, you know, you've got to keep the right people in the right jobs to keep doing that. And I think that's that's the, the beauty of what's going on um, behind the scenes at Forrest at the moment. They've got the right people in the right places. And uh, if you get it right on the pitch, I've said this on many occasions, then we can see a brighter future. Probably a tough question to answer, Steve, but right at the top of the ladder when you've got young lads who are earning, you know, they're not played a first-team game, they're getting 40, 50 grand a week. It must be hard to bring those through to, you know, be responsible people and responsible footballers and make the grade. It must be a big challenge to develop young players at the top of the game now, in a sense, mustn't it? Well, I don't know. I can't speak uh, from experience, but, you know, it's motivation. What is your motivation in life? Your motivation is just to make money and you don't make a first-team appearance. You know, you, you've done well for yourself. But if your motivation is making first-team appearances, uh, playing for your country, uh, winning trophies, you know, that's that's a self-driven motivation. So motivation is a, is a personal thing and depending on wherever people strive to be, uh, as long as they can get there in the right way, uh, they've done, done really well for themselves. Let's um, look ahead then for Forrest. Just going on that quickly, you, you yeah, mentioned sure. Harry Kane. I think, you know, as a role model, there couldn't be anybody better than him at this particular moment in time. Jose Mourinho's turned round, you know, a little bit of how Tottenham played before and Harry Kane's had to adapt to that. And you see him dropping deeper and, and you know, being the catalyst for what goes after that. He'll hold it up and it, he'll turn, he'll play you know, Son in. I mean, that partnership at the moment... And I think everybody should follow his example. He's getting a lot of money, but he's still desperate to be the best. 
And the mm. ones who are desperate to be the best, you know, like the uh, Ronaldo's, the Messi's, who continually do it at the top of the game. You know, David Platt always said, you know, the great players don't get better, they get more consistent. And that always sticks in my mind. And I, I think when you, you read those words through, it's right. You know, it's consistency that make great players. You know, mm. not ones who flit in and out. You know, we have two games in seven, decent ones. You know, so if anybody wants to, a role model, watch what Harry Kane does, how he goes about his business, you know, and, and people like him. And Michael Owen used to be the same when he played. You know, he never, you know, he did what he did and that was it. You know, he was one of those players who, you know, you could look up to and on a regular basis knowing that he was going to do it. And that despite the money they were on, they were desperate to win things. And, you know, they're, they're the great players for me. You know, yeah, they're getting the money. I, I ain't got a problem with the money they're getting. It's not their fault. You know, they get paid it. Everybody would want to get, you know, the same money you go through Nottingham and ask all young lads, you know, would you like to be a professional footballer? Would you like 100 grand a week? We'd all say yes. But it's about your attitude when you're getting that money. And there's certain players at the moment out in the cold in the Premiership. I won't name names. We know who they are. And I think they go about it the wrong way. So there is a right way for me and a wrong way. And the right way is the likes of Harry Kane. You know, when Lampard, Gerard played, they went about it the right way. You know, so, you know, put it in perspective. Mm, true, true. You'd have taken 100 grand a week when you were playing, Steve, wouldn't you? I'd have taken 100 pound a week when I first started playing, to be fair. I was on 60 quid a week when I first came to Forest. Yeah. But it was all about playing. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, in the summer, I, I used to go and just run, you know, not heavily, but I used to tick over all through the summer, you know, so mm. I knew when I got back pre season that I'd be, you know, straight off. And but the rest of the lads used to hate me because I love running, you know, Robbo and people like that. But it's because I, in the summer, I just kept ticking over, you mm. know, because I wanted to be, you know, still all through my career, I wanted to be, try and be the best I could possibly, you know, could be for myself and my teammates. Mm. So, that, you know, that's the way I went about it. I'm sure you, you were the same, chap. Uh, well, I didn't keep ticking over as much as you guys in the summer, to be fair. I didn't really enjoy the running. Uh, I enjoyed the football. I enjoyed the work. And it's something I massively miss, the training every day and being super fit. I don't miss the playing at all, in all honesty. Uh, but pre-season wasn't something that I look forward to each year. But you didn't even have an official plan to, before you came back to pre-season training like everybody's given now. So, you know, you had to look after yourself in whatever way you could. Uh, but I didn't enjoy running as much as Baz did. We just knew Woolerton Park. That's all we knew. Yeah, we just once around the lake was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's enough right here for everybody, actually. But we, that's what you knew. You knew where you were going. You knew what the process was. And you just got on with it. Hmm. Hmm. Here's a question I don't think I've asked you before, Steve. Did you ever have the chance to go for better money? You spent you know, the vast majority of your career at Forest, your, your peak years. Did you ever have a chance to move on or not? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, I went all through my career, obviously, at Forest until uh, 99 when I left to Barnes on a free. I went from Barnes to Grimsby on a free. Uh, and then the only time I was bought was when I left Nuneaton as a manager. I got co They had compensation. So they didn't spend any money on me till I was over 40, which is a bit of a weird one. <laughs> yeah, um, about Grimsby, on they're in big trouble, aren't they? They're not in great shape at all. And I obviously got beat 3 0 by Port Vale at the weekend. And I, I know Paul Hurst and I know Doig, obviously. And they've got a huge task to, uh, you know, to keep those in the league. Let's um, look ahead to Forest's upcoming games then. Um, it's Millwall on Saturday. Then they've got Middlesbrough, which obviously won't be easy. Coventry, Barnsley, who are never easy. And Wickham in their next five games. Is this, if they're going to steadily climb the table and have a comfortable mid-table finish, is this where they need to start moving, Gary, now, do you think, looking at those games? To be fair, looking at those games, they're capable of winning all those games. Hmm. Um, let's put it again in perspective. We beat Preston, who we couldn't beat before. You know, they were one of the bogey teams. Cardiff at home, we couldn't beat them. Was it six times they beaten us before? You know, nine so out of ten or something. Yeah. Yeah. So we've you know we've got over those sort of hurdles. So you know there should be no hurdles there for us now. You know, Barnsley have always said we we struggle against, but I think if you stay fit with the, the squad we've got at the moment, um, you know we should be able to overcome these things. You know, Wickham. You, you feel a little bit sorry for Wickham because in games you see them, they, they're so good for so long and they've, they've conceded so many late goals and thrown good positions away. But the Championship, as Chet will tell you, it's the hardest league in the world, you know, because you're all desperate to get in the Premier League. So everybody's throwing everything at it and it's, there's not one easy game comes up. 
You know, they're all difficult, and these fight, these games will be difficult. And Chris will be telling them that. He'll say, well, don't, because we've got Coventry, Wickham and Barnsley, think we're automatically going to win. You know, and, and that's what I liked about the Tottenham performance against Marine. You know, they took no chances. They were very professional, and that's what you have to do against teams everybody expects you to beat. So, you know, just do as if you were playing Bournemouth, you know, at the top of the league or Norwich. Play the same way, treat them with the same respect and be professional about it. And this particular run could, you know, be very significant. You know, if he gets players in who he wants in January, you could see movements up the table and who knows? Oh, don't say who knows. What do you, you think? Don't, you don't know. I mean, you know, you've seen teams when Roy Keane was at Sunderland, the manager, they came from the bottom of the table and got promotion. Hmm. You know, so those things are pop uh, possible. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to big it all up. But, you know, you, you put a run together, you, you get clean sheets, which, you know, the gaffer always used to base everything on. Clean sheets and, you know, build from the back, play from the back, be strong at the back. And you've got to, you know, look at that now exactly the same. You've got that part of it really well covered at the moment. But we need to really get that, you know, creativity in the final third a little bit better than it is. Everybody mm. keeps talking about, well, we only had one shot on target. We only had three shots on target. You know, those stats have got to improve a little. Um, so, and you, you've got to get the strikers, you know, support and, um, you know, chances being created for them. Because if you don't, they're just going to keep coming, dropping deeper, trying to get involved. Good strikers do that. But mm. then you, you've got them where you don't want them. You want them where they're going to be most dangerous. So, mm. you know, you've got to get that final third, I think, sorted out, you know, pretty quickly if if, if, it, if it's all possible. Do you think the rest of this month's a big opportunity, Steve, on and off the field then with those fixtures coming up and, and the opportunity to, to make some signings and some sales? Yeah, it's huge. You know, you're playing against Millwall and Middlesbrough, really two really determined, dogged teams. And, and then the next three, you come to your Wickham and your Barnsley. I know Barnsley are in a good run of form themselves. But you have to start turning now, picking up points in clean sheets, uh, to picking up two or three wins on the bounce. You know, because the team around you, if they win a game, you're always playing catch people. You can only get two draws and some team, one team wins one game. You know, you minus a point on them. So I think it's important now to maintain the clean sheets to guarantee your point, but start to look, look to picking up wins now as opposed to just draws. Uh, I think they've won one, drawn three, won one in the league. So it's, mm. it's an upward turn, uh, but more consistency and more wins does give you that breather of climbing yourself up the table. Do you think the manager's seeing consistency in selection now? He's seen, he, he didn't make many changes between the two league games. Do you think he has come to know who his best players are, who he might not want at the club? Has he had enough time to, to work that out now, Steve? Possibly, but I'm sure I'm sure that you know himself and you know whatever capacity or the recruitment is done at Forest that they'll have targets. And like Gary said, you know we need an attacking midfield player. We need somebody who's going to create opportunities in the top third of the pitch, and somebody else who can score a goal as opposed to relying on Lewis and relying on Lyle to get you the odd goal. We need more goals, basically. Mm -hmm. um Talking off transfers then, Gary, over the weekend they were linked with Philip Kravinovic again and also Ben Whiteman, who's a name that's come up, the Doncaster midfielder, both 24. If you could pick one of those players to go for, would you look for the younger, the, the League One player who's played a lot of games or the Premier League player who's been out of the team? Would you favour one of the direction Forest need to go down recruitment-wise? Well, the problem there, is the Premier League player going to come and really try? Or is he just going to, you know, come and say, OK, well, I, I like to see if players are coming from the Premiership thinking, right, I've got a point to prove here. I'm going to show my gaffer, you know, what I can do. But I'm not sure that's always the case. I mean, I've never heard of either of those two, I'm afraid. So Forest fans might say, well, who are they? You know, who are they? Where, you know, even if one's a Premier League player. So I, I might be a bit naive in not knowing them, but... Uh, you don't know every player in every club. And I think names are always more acceptable for fans. Uh, you know, the fans know, well, he's all well, what he's done and, you know, what a great sign in he is, you know, because he's done this. Um, you know, the one you think of who did come in and was brilliant for Forest was Asamba Longa. You know, binding from Peterborough was an absolute steal and he was brilliant for Forest. Um, so they're the sort of players, yeah, that's one player you can look back on and say, you know, we took a chance and, whoa, did that pay off for us? But that doesn't always happen. And I think 
for the championship, you need championship players, players who know it. I think that's where maybe Carvalho floundered a little bit. Diaz, you know, the, the players who came from, um, you know, abroad, who probably weren't expecting what they, you know, what they saw at the championship level, because it is a hard, hard league, harder than I think any other league. Um, so I think Chris will be looking very closely at the, what he needs and maybe a bit of experience creative wise and it'll be very interesting i think the one big problem he's got is getting rid of people mm. because there are that many players who aren't going to get a look in at the first team level who are on that good of wages they they're very difficult to get rid of mm. Mm. i know we're going down the levels again here steve but as a manager if you were presented with a player who played you know 300 games in league two but was 32 versus the young guy who's 21 and he's, you know, done really well in the Northern Division 1 or the level below you, what would separate those players from you? How, how would you view that as a manager if you had to choose between those two kind of players to sign? What, take them into the Forest squad? No, into your base. For into my squad, I'm going to say, crikey. Uh, <laughs> it depends. Again, it, it looks, it depends where you need the players. You know, I'd rather take my chance on a 21 year old player that we can develop and you've got some productivity at the end of it all whether he moves on and it looks good on your behalf as well as opposed to bringing somebody that's 33 that's going to be here for a maximum of two years you know for what reasons are they wanting to come to the club we we are in the environment really of developing players as well not only from our academy to our first team but from our first team to hopefully give people the opportunity to get back into the league you know Baz mm -hmm. came from non-league uh, played at Long Eaton and got himself in you know got himself England caps and you know everybody aspires to be that person and you've got to work hard both in the management in the coaching and also the player to get to where you need to be do you look at do you bother about the character of the player and how he fits into the dressing room absolutely yeah absolutely they have to fit you know we would go look at the players ourselves you know, send people to watch them go look at them yourself and just do your homework on what they are who they are and what kind of person they are yeah absolutely how many players who don't fit the mould can you carry in a team? I suppose like Stan Collymore, I'm thinking of for you, who was a bit of a maverick and probably a pain. Have, yeah, absolutely. If, if you have a maverick, that, listen, you don't have to get on with everybody. Uh, not everybody's going to be your mate in the team, 100%. Uh, but they have to contribute and you have to have that uh, mutual respect when you're on the pitch and when you're training. If you don't want to talk to him off the pitch, not a problem. But you have to contribute. You have to give him what he needs so he can give you the best chance that the team can survive. Hmm. Is that how Stan was in the dressing room? Frank Clark came on here and said he was basically a nightmare, but he was worth the trouble. And he mentioned yourself and a few other senior pros as people who um, not help keep Stan in check. That won't be the right phrase. But, you know, communicate with the manager that Stan was worth the trouble. Is that, is that fair to say? 100%. Yeah, you had to put it with Stan at times, didn't come in on Sundays when we were supposed to be in. Uh, he was ill again. Uh, but as long as Stan was in before the game, as long as Stan did what he did during the game, you can put up with so much. Uh, but like I say, there is a point where you go enough's enough uh, on some people. Uh, Mr. Hoy Van Hoydonk was, you know, one which was a little bit of a bit of a problem, but that got resolved in the end. But uh, you know, these fantastic players sometimes they have flaws, uh, whether it be personal or whether it be professional. You you know you have to respect them in your team uh, and just work with them. Did you have that in your team as well, Gary? I mean, John Robertson likes to drink and a smoke, I suppose, but was there a few Mavericks? No, no, that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a fallacy. He wasn't the biggest drinker. Uh, yeah, he liked to fag. We all know that, but he was a genius, you know, and you made um, amendments for him. You know, people did a little bit more work than, you know, to allow Robbo to do what he did because you knew when he got the ball at his feet, he was just mesmerical. You know, he was just unbelievable. Um, but, you know, right footed player playing on the left, you know, he could go both ways. He wasn't the fastest, but over five yards, I'll tell you what, he was difficult to stop. You know, the great Liverpool team couldn't stop him. They put two on him. And because he got that ability to go inside and out, you know, he was so difficult to stop. Um, I, I look at players now, you look at Cantona, you know, the Rebels, you know, he, he was allowed to fit in at Manchester United because of what he did. But the one I look at now is Ibrahimovic. You know, he's still playing for Milan. You know, I do Italian football on a regular basis and he's still hungry for it. You know, I thought he might be a little bit lazy and a little bit, you know, blasé, but he wasn't, you know, and I was quite impressed with that. And uh, going towards 40, 
to still have the appetite to do what he did. That's what you want. If you've got that sort of player, you've got that ability, and he still wants to do it, you know, you've got a hell of a player. And I think mm. attitude is a big, big part in players. And I think Chris will be now realising the characters of his players. Brian Clough was brilliant at it. Chet will tell you that. He was brilliant at identifying strengths and weaknesses in every player in his squad. Mm. Mm. And I think Chris will be looking at that and, uh, you know, he'll be telling his backroom staff, you know, to keep an eye on and they'll have a get together and, you know, discuss players and what they think about their attitudes. And I think that's the right way to go about it. You know, you want good vibes in the dressing room because if you've got good vibes in the dressing room, you take that out on the pitch. Mm. Was that your experience of Brian Clough? There was a slightly different era, but you played for him as well. Steve, did he identify players, you know, what they could, what they couldn't do, what they responded to and what they didn't do when you were playing for him? He knew everybody inside and out. Uh, mm. He wouldn't forget a thing. Uh, he'd bring up games which were played six months ago, one split second of a, of a game. Uh, but he knew everybody. He knew what you were about. He knew everything about your family. You know, the man did his homework. Uh, and when you didn't feel great, he used to pick you up and make you feel a lot better. And then when you thought you were Billy Big Balls, he'd shoot you down in flames. So this, you know, the psychology in the game was there then, but it was all done by the same person. It ended up being the manager all the time. Let's finish by changing tack then. Uh, Steve's on here for his capacity as Baseford manager because um, your youth team have had this magnificent FA Cup run, Steve, and they're playing um, West Brom in the in the FA Youth Cup tomorrow. What can you tell people about that? Because I think they can watch it on a live stream. I mean, it's been, it's been a great run for them, hasn't it? It's been unbelievable. We've already had six games to where we've got to get to. Uh, the last two rounds, we played the FL clubs. We went to Port Vale and beat them 4-1. We beat Grimsby unbeaten all season in their respective league, 1-0 uh, in the last round. And we've had some obstacles in the way, to be fair, Matt. Uh, obviously, we are classed as non-elite football. Uh, we've had to apply to the FA so we can carry on training. Uh, we've had to adhere to all protocols, obviously, which is fantastic for the football club to have to get this game in the first place, but it's behind closed doors completely. So same as the Aston Villa scenario at the weekend uh, when they played Liverpool, not parents aren't even allowed in the game. So we are streaming the game live. Uh, it's available through the uh, club website uh, to watch, but they've done great. The majority of the team are just first year. So the 16, 17 years old and we're playing against West Bromwich Albion. We've gone from doing our homework with uh, Grimsby when they played Accrington and Burton and Scunthorpe to watching West Brom play Spurs and West Ham and Southampton. So it's been good for the lads to watch, uh, but it'll be tough, but it's something we're really looking forward to. And you've got good, talented boys there, I take it. They're one or two, you're not going to say they're all going to make it, but do you think there's one or two who might make a career in the game now? Uh, hopefully. Uh, I think seven of the group got released at 16 years old from uh, respective uh, professional clubs. Uh, one of the boys was at Forest, who's already come on for the first team this year and scored in the trophy. Uh, Wade Hines, who's only 17. Rory Harrison, who got released by Rotherham. He's made his first team appearance this year already. Um, we had a kid who played last year, 16. Mackenzie Rooney, a centre-back, who played in the Cairns Cup against Forest 23s. Uh, so, listen, we know what we are as a football club. We have to produce these little diamonds uh, to, to get some productivity for us. And hopefully, like I said before, these kids can go pro progress back into the league again. What about your first team then? You, uh, I was looking before, you, you, you're you doing really well in the league, but you've only played nine games. C can you even have a season now with the way things are in the wider society, do you think? I think the official status is indefinitely suspended at present. Uh, over, I've been here now, this is my second season. Uh, in all, we've played 41 games over two seasons so far. Uh, we played, uh, obviously, 32 last year and we played... Uh, we played nine this year, so 41 over two years. So we haven't even completed the season yet. And it's tough. It's tough financially for the owner and the chairman. Uh, we've had no fans in. We've had no league games since the beginning of November. We were fortunate to be in the trophy still. So we had three games during November and December. But since 19th of December, the first team I've been able to train because we're non-elite football and everything's shut down. You know, and, and the wider scheme of it is obviously there's pandemic. Uh, we need to make sure that the world is going in the right direction with regarding vaccines and protocols and everything else. And we adhere to all the rules, but it's really tough as a football club to to survive. And there's going to be a lot of clubs in the same boat or even worse than that we are. Yeah, I mean, you're fortunate to have an owner who's putting his hand in his pocket. Do you fear for the non-league game 
in general coming out of this when the, hopefully the world's back right? Are we going to lose a lot of clubs, do you think? Possibly. You know, I, you know, I can only speak on behalf of our football club uh, that the chairman has been fantastic. And obviously we've got players who are on deals here and he's had to honour the deals. Uh, but there's other clubs where I don't know where their revenue stream comes from. Normally if it's just from gates and from uh, sales of pies and beers or whatever it is and there's nothing coming in, I don't know where they go, to be fair, Matt. Uh, mm. So it's really, really dark times for the non-league football at present. Yeah, I mean, Gary, you came through the non-league game, as Steve said earlier, through Long Eaton. Are, are you worried about not just non-league, League One, League Two, the Championship? Are, are you fearful for the future of football at the moment? Uh, a little bit, but it, I think there's enough money in the game, without a doubt, to be helping everybody out. Mm. You know, it, it's not about elite and, you know, lower Football's football. No matter where you, you start, no matter where you are now, you know it's a it, it, it's like a one big family, and you, you families help each other out, and you just hope that in respect of football, you know it, it comes a massive nowhere compared with getting this pandemic beaten and getting everybody to do the right things. But you know while it's as it is, uh, you know I think uh, you know the the top levels with the money that's about, uh, you know, it's got to seat down and it's got to help everybody because it's so important. You know, grassroots are so important. You know, you get some diamonds out of grassroots football who come through and that's got to continue. And it's, you know, it's, it's co a collective thing. Everybody within football are in it together, no matter if you, you know, you're the top player in the Premier League or, you know, you're at the bottom level of, you know, wherever you are. It needs to be helped. It needs to be sustained. And there has to be a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question of entirely personal opinion. I mean, do you think clubs like Forest are going to see their season suspended very soon, Steve, or not? I mean, it's hard to say, isn't it? But the way the way the graphs are going, it does make you wonder. Do you think? Well, I don't think that they, it can continue to go on. I think there's 122 cases in the Premier League uh, last week that were tested positive. So, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's supposed to adhere to all the protocols, but this this new strain and the South African strain is just getting worse, Matt. And at some point, I think there has to be a decision made where everything just has to have a circuit break and see if we can put a lid on this for a time being and hopefully get that up upward to on the way down. Mm. But what, I mean, what, yeah. gets, what gets me is, why don't people just say, right, I'm going to wear a mask. Whenever I go out, I wear a mask every time I go out and I don't take it off till I come back. You know, because obviously I've got my reasons, obviously. But I wouldn't do it. I, we're that close with this, these jabs and the NHS are working that hard. You know, people say it's hard for every, you know, football. But the NHS is the place where it's hard. You go and go into hospitals and see how hard these people work in there. It's unbelievable the job they're doing. And if we can't all go out and just every time we go out, put a mask on, it's no hardship. My glasses you steam up, but I take them off and put them in my pocket. It's not a hardship to wear a mask. You know, let's do the right thing and we'll get back to normal quicker. If we don't, we'll carry on having circuit breaks. We'll carry on having lockdowns. Don't people realise this? You know, are we that daft? Do the right things. Wear a mask when you go out. Because this, like Steve said, this new strain apparently transmits very quickly. And, and you look in London now, they're saying one in 42 people has got COVID. And, mm. it, you know, eight out of 10 is the new stream of it. So that's how important it is. And that's how bad it is at the moment. You know, the, the NHS is being overwhelmed. And, you know, just for goodness sake, it's not a hardship to put a mask on. Just do it. Mm. Well, my wife works in a hospital, so I can attest to that. Um, right. Well, obviously, the world is not a great place at the moment, but hopefully listening to this podcast and watching some football might distract people just for a few minutes or 48 minutes and 52 seconds in the case of this podcast. So thanks to Gary and Steve for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we wish your Baseford team uh, all the luck in the world in the Youth Cup game. Steve, and, uh, Thank I'll you. Um, plug the like in the comments for this and we'll get something in the paper for you as well. Um, Gary, thanks for joining us as normal and no doubt you'll be on again very soon. And thanks to everyone who watched along, listened along and uh, with some comments. We'll be back next week as normal and we hope everyone stays well and stays safe. See you soon.